But good morning and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. If you're sitting next to a mom, a wife, a grandma, would you just show some appreciation to them? I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. And I believe in signs and wonders. Yes, I do. Yes, I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven And yeah, my praise belongs to you forever This is is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters, hot with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what he started. Oh, yes, our God will finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I'm not dead and you're not done Mm. Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done Oh, no, no Cause greater things are still to come Declare Oh, I believe If I'm not dead and you're not done No, no, no Greater things are still to come Oh, I I'm not dead, you're not done, or you're not done with me, no. Greater things are still to come. I believe, oh, I believe, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. Somebody testify. Oh, my Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Your life. This is my testimony. From death to life. This grace we wrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony.
His reckless love. And we can hear that and think, man, I, I thought God was not reckless. Well, to us, from our point of view, it looks reckless. From our earthly, physical eyes, it seems reckless that God would give up watching over the 99 to come chase after me. But I, for one, am glad that he chased this one that went away and he called back to him, that he chased after me. No mountain he won't climb up coming after you as well. And we're just so grateful for his presence. And this morning, as we continue our worship, we'd love to pray for you. Um, maybe there's some shadows that you need to be lit up. Maybe there's some mountains that you need God to climb for you today. Maybe there, maybe there's a wall that's in the way that's holding you back from taking that next step to whatever God's calling you to do that you want him just to kick down. Um, but if all that, above all of that, the key thing is that he's after our hearts and that he has our hearts and we give him our hearts. 
Man, if that's a key prayer for somebody, we'd love to pray for you. Our altar team is going to be underneath the side screens, and our prayer team is online right now. All you have to do is type prayer into the chat, and we would love to pray for you right where you're at. And another one of our worship, or actually our prayer teams got together, and they said, um, Lord, what do you want to speak to your church today? And so here's some of those things. So if any one of these resonates with you, we'd love to pray for you. For any of these and for anything else that's on your heart, seek his divine direction. Mountains shall be cast into the sea. I love that. Didn't we just say that? Well, um, fullness of joy in his presence. Chest pain. If you got chest pr- uh, pain, we'd love to pray for you. You're not alone. God is with you. So if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling uh, despondent, lack of hope, we'd love to pray for you to remind you that you're not alone. God is with you. As we continue our worship today, declaring his worth, um, just know that you're worthy of God's love. There's nothing that you can do that would change that. change from circumstance to situation mm, and I'm gonna sing till my heart starts changing oh I'm gonna worship till I mean every word cause the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve. Come on, church, just give him my worship. I give you my worship, and you still deserve it. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my song. I pour out your praises and blessing and breaking. You're worthy. You're worthy, you're worthy of my song. And I'm gonna live like my King is risen, gonna preach to my soul. That is already one, oh, even though I can't see it, I'm gonna keep believing that every promise you make is as good as the, oh, I give you, I give you my worship, yeah, you still deserve it, you were. song pour out your praises in blessing and breaking you're worthy you're worthy yeah. oh you're worthy of my song you're worthy you're worthy yeah. jesus you're worthy of my song you're worthy you're worthy yeah. jesus you're worthy of my song you're worthy Jesus, you're worthy of my song. You're worthy. Oh, you're worthy. Yes. You're so worthy, God. Because when I sat by that hospital bed, you were worthy. When she could barely lift her head, you were worthy. And after all those tears were shed, you were worthy I'll never stop singing your praise No, I'll never stop singing your praise And in the blessing and the pain You are worthy Whether you say yes or no or wait You are worthy And through it all I choose to say You are worthy I'll never stop singing your praise. No, I'll never stop singing your praise. And when I finally see your face, I'm crying. And when you wipe these tears away, I'm crying. Stop singing. I'll never stop. No, I'll never stop singing. 
exist If I sing and break in your word I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must stay. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. Just one move with my arms just wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a So come on. 
up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside
you're worthy. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is this one or two people would lift up a hallelujah in this place. Hallelujah, God, we love you, Jesus. You're worthy of it all. Well, you know, hallelujah in English means praise the Lord. And in that song, we sing the words, get up and praise the Lord. You know, every morning that we're able to get up and get out of bed, our lives should be a living testimony of praising God the Lord. Amen? That's what we live for, to praise Him and to worship Him and to walk in fullness of grace in His love. Well, we're here to, this morning not just gathered. Well, first of all, let me say Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. And thank you for giving up going out to dinner or something maybe by being here with us. But those of you online, we welcome you and Happy Mother's Day to you as well. But I also want to welcome, we have a lot of special guests with us here today. Let's welcome those guests who have come to be a part of the family whose children are being dedicated. So welcome to Christian Life. And we realize that some of you may have even given up going to your own church. And uh, we're, we're blessed to have you here among us, worshiping God. So... The families that are going to have their children dedicated, if you'll be coming up at this time. And we had said we welcome uh, any of the family members to come up that are comfortable coming up. I'm not sure about all of those that came with the bolsters. <laughs> we wouldn't have enough room on the platform for all of you. But thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of. It, it just shows the love and that you have and how you are standing behind and beside these children and their families. What a blessing. What a blessing. Let's try to scoot together and make room. You know, we follow uh, what Luke chapter 2 tells us. Jesus, at eight days old, was taken to the temple, and he was dedicated and he was prayed for. And when he was prayed for, could we turn the music down just a little? When he was prayed for, he was prayed for health and safety when he left the temple to go home. And he also was prayed that he would have wisdom and would also have favor with God. And that's what we're believing here today. Uh, this morning, we're not baptizing the children. We're dedicating them to the Lord. Uh, we believe that baptism comes that at a time when they are old enough to make their own decision and their own choices. And uh, that's what we're dedicating them to, that the day will come when they will make that decision and they will choose to be water baptized as well. So at this time, the pastors are going, there are pastors. Do I have a pastor with each child and family? Dennis, Linda, someone down here? Oh, we, we're good. Okay. Don't try to move on the platform. Um, we're going to have the pastors pray right now for the children, for the dedication, and then I'll close with a prayer for charging and dedicating the parents to their calling. Amen. And we'd like for you to join in this and be a part of it. Uh, if you are comfortable and believe in raising your, stretching out your hand toward them to give a blessing. Do that while the pastors are praying.
Well, parents, we also believe that you have a very, very vital part in this, but it doesn't stop with you. We believe that grandparents and cousins and nieces and nephews and all of those have a part in the raising of these children. And uh, we challenge you today to take them to church and let them be taught. It doesn't have to be this church, but take them to a place where God and godly people are teaching them about the love and the truths that God has for their lives. And it doesn't stop there. It's not in church that they're going to learn everything. We want them to learn it in the homes, as you walk with them, as you talk with them, as you pray with them, as you have a meal with them, that you share what God has planned for them in their lives. Amen? So let me pray over all of you and charge you today to raise these children this way. And Father, we just thank you for your presence here today. I thank you for every person that is online and that is here today supporting these families, Lord. We challenge them and that they will raise these children to know of you, to know what you, Jesus, did for them, what you, Jesus, went to the cross and died, but that you arose again and that their sins can be forgiven and that they can have a promise of eternal life. But in the meantime, let them have safety, let them have wisdom poured into their lives and let them have favor in God's way. So we pray that parents, grandparents, all of those that are speaking in the children's lives will speak not of the worldly things, but speak of the truth of God. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Now we're all going to safely get down the stairs. One last time, I want to thank you. What a special day it is that you have come to be here on Mother's Day and to support these families. Thank you for coming. Amen. Can we give it up again for all the kids being dedicated today? I tell you what, it's so precious. I didn't do a first service, but I tell you, I wish I had a kid just so I can come back and just be like, Hi, your way, ya. Lion King, Simba. <laughs> and it's just so precious to see him up. We, I think we're done. Yeah, we're done with kids. But, um... It's so awesome to be with you guys today for Mother's Day. Just so I can go, hi, yo, hey, um, But, uh, like, so we're going to move into a time of offering and giving. And one of the things that we get to talk about is uh, highlighting different ministries that are doing awesome things in our area. And the one that we want to highlight this, this day today is Living Alternatives. And so Living Alternatives, what they do is they are committed to saving the lives of unborn children by promoting life-affirming options and providing practical assistance while sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and in deed. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, uh, my mom had me when she was still in high school, when she was 17. And uh, I mean, praise God that she's like, she said, I want to choose life. And um, the cool thing about what they do too is they also provide ministry though for, for people who've gone through traumatic and, and really hard times. I can tell you, when we were having our third children, or third child, actually, um, we went to Living Alternatives because we didn't have an alternative. We didn't have insurance, we couldn't go to Carl. We we're like, it costs how much? We don't have insurance, we can't do that. And so we went to Living Alternatives and and it was rough. We, uh, we were sitting there talking to the nurse and she's looking for the baby and then she's looking for a heartbeat and you can just see this look on her face of concern and worry. And she's like, we're having a hard time finding a regular heartbeat. And we didn't realize it at that time, but we were in the beginning stages of our first, and praise God, our, our last miscarriage. And <clears throat> it would be a couple of days after that, that we would mis miscarry on November 4th. And, uh, but God was still working in the midst of us. We were asking questions like, God, do we still have more children? Is, do you, is it your will for us to have more children? And it wasn't too long after that, actually about three months after that, we ended up being pregnant again. 
It was awesome. And Living Alternatives was there for us when we needed to have another sonogram. And the cool thing about this story, too, is God was really trying to renew our hope in this. Because how many of you know, for those who have lost a child, it really hits you. Well, as we're about ready to go back to um, the sonogram, the nurse tells us, hey, by the way, it looks like that the, the due date is going to be November 4th, the same day that we had a miscarriage. We took that as a sign that God was like, you don't have to worry about it. It's going to be all good. And as if we didn't need anything else, I want to say about a month or two later, Kara wasn't even showing yet. And we were at a, a ministry event where they were praying over different leaders in the church. And they prophesied and they said to Kara, they said, and he's like, I just feel this emotion. I just want to tell you that it's going to be full term. And when I tell you that we both cried, crocodile tears, for hope, for just this idea that we don't have to worry um, because it came to fruition. Our little Chase, we call him Chaser, Chase Alexander came out of that womb, tore his own umbilical cord. I'm like, he's trying to steal my thunder. I'm like, I'm going to cut whatever is little left of that thing, snip, snip. And, uh, and guess what? He was actually due full term on his day, November 4th. Amen. And we thank God for that because what could have been a day of really despondency and uh, November 4th going forward of just really sadness turned into what people call a rainbow baby, the rainbow after the storm. And so we we're thankful that Living Alternatives was with us through those steps to um, help pray for us. They prayed for us, they spoke with us, they helped us walk through the, that really, really hard time. And so I want you to know when you give um, throughout the year, part of what we give goes to supporting ministries like Living Alternatives, and we're so grateful that they're here. They even got like an, a location, satellite location here in Rantoul, um, down by Seek and Find, so we're so appreciative of them. And so uh, as we continue with worship, with our offering, there's four ways that you can give. You can either give in the buckets on your way out. You can give by mailing a check to Christian Life. You can also text uh, key, uh, the keyword giving to 217-462-8075. And you can also give on our website and our app. Would you all join me, bow your heads in uh, blessing this offering as we get ready. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much that... Uh, for ministries like Living Alternatives. I pray that you bless them, Lord. I pray that more and more people would just uh, be blessed by their, by their ministry, really, is what it is. And Lord, we just speak life over that. God, we also just, uh, we pray for, for this day. We thank you so much that, that, that we have moms, that we have grandmas, that we have people in our lives that we're there for us. But praying grandmas, praying moms. I don't know where I'd be without my, my praying grandmoms. Uh, God, we thank you so much. We're so grateful for them. So, Lord, as we continue this service, Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering, that it would multiply and grow your kingdom. And we pray in your name. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. My name is Grace, and we're so glad you're here. Are you new to Christian life? We'd love to get to know you better and give you a welcome gift. Just fill out a new here card and drop it by the info center or type new in the comments and we will mail your gift. To celebrate the special women at Christian Life, we have a special gift for each mom and woman over the age of 18. You can type mom in the chat if you're watching online or you can grab your devotional on your way out of church. While you're on your way out, stop by the photo booth and take a picture with your family to celebrate. Do you need healing? Do you crave a fresh word from God specifically for you? Then put Healing Rooms on your calendar for next Sunday from 3 to 4.30. If you're ready to receive healing mentally, spiritually, and physically, then head over to christian.life forward slash sign up to reserve your spot for next week. Do you want to go back and watch past sermons? Take Christian Life with you by downloading the app. Just go to christian.life forward slash app to download it and watch from anywhere. You can even take notes on the sermon today by tapping on sermon notes. To find out more about everything happening at church, just go to christian.life forward slash sign up. That's all the weekend updates we've got for you today. Now let's prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Anybody else pumped to be in the house of the Lord today? 
You know, I was thinking as, as we had the kids up here, first service and second service, what I was thinking was, man, how, how amazing is this, that this is exactly what Jesus told us. He told us that we would bring the children to him, right? Ultimately, we're not supposed to keep the children away, but we're supposed to bring our children to him. And even so much to say that we're supposed to kind of have some of a little child in us. You know, we're supposed to have faith like a child. And so what an appropriate way to start out service. Anybody agree? So grateful for for you to be here today. I want to welcome you here if this is your first time here, or maybe you haven't been back in some time. My name is Brian. I'm the care pastor here at Christian Life Church. And it's my pleasure to be in front of you today with a message that's been on my heart since 2019. 2019, I learned a lesson, something that God gave me. And ultimately, I haven't been able to share it up to this point. So grateful to be able to be here and do that today. But before we get into that, I want to go ahead and let's, let's talk to God. If you'd bow your heads with me. Well, Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank, the, thank you that you give us um, this outlet, this, this peace, this, this thing of coming together where we get to learn from one another. We get to be in the presence, your presence together. Lord, that we get to worship together. What a blessing that we get to get to do in this day. And Lord, I would just pray over the ears and the hearts and the minds today, Lord, that they'd be opened. Lord, that they would receive what you have for them. And we just seal this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So today, what I want to talk to you about actually is Quite simple, although we make it a lot more simple, a lot, a lot more difficult than it really is. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus commands us to make disciples of all nations. Disciples of all nations. That's actually called the Great Commission. Anybody in here heard of the Great Commission? Look, what we've been called to do has been to, to take what Jesus has given us and then hand it back out. Right? We've been told that we are supposed to accept what Jesus has, the grace that he has for us, and then give it back to the world. Right? It's actually a command. It's something that we've been given as a responsibility as believers in order to expand what Jesus did and is still doing here on this earth. But here's what I want you to know. Think of what that means when we allow our culture to influence how we go about doing that. How many of you know that we live in a way different culture today than Jesus did when he spoke those words? Come on, the culture today is nothing like what it was, right? Here's the, here's the deal about this. We are bombarded as Christians every single day by our culture. So much so that unfortunately, What this means all too often is that we are molded and shaped by our culture more than we are molded and shaped by the Word of God. That is the truth. And look, I'm not standing up here today telling you that that's you guys and not me. I'm saying that's us. We often are so wrapped around the culture, we don't even realize how much it has us. Here's the thing. I could go go on all day about how that kind of manifests in the life of a believer in this culture. But I want to focus in on two ways, two ways in which our culture actually makes it really hard to do the Great Commission. See, first, we live in a culture that values influence more than just about anything else. And you know I'm telling you the truth. Like, don't we value influence here in this country? The reality, though, is that if we value having a following over pointing people to the one they should follow, well, then we have a problem, don't we? We have a big problem because that's not what it's supposed to be. You know, there are people now that are simply called influencers. Anybody know what that is? Anybody heard of that? Nobody? Come on now. I know you young ones in the audience know what an influencer is. Look, the reality is is that these people... These people actually take social media and they influence their followers. They could get their followers to sign on to buying certain products, to believing certain things, and doing something as dumb as eating a Tide Pod. For real. Come on, anybody been here a couple years ago with the Tide Pod fiasco? They had to start from somewhere. The reality is is that these these, uh, are not always bad, though. To have 
to have uh, influencer doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing because there are plenty of people out there that are influencing for Jesus Christ. There are plenty of people out there that are influencing because of Jesus Christ and they're rooted in the right things, but we have to get real. We have to because this desire to become an influencer at its root is tied to our human desire to leave a legacy. Isn't that true? Don't we want to do that, all of us? Don't we want to know that we are leaving a legacy for our children? Aren't we wanting to leave a legacy so that we, are, that we would live on and on and on? But here's the deal. we got to be careful with that because that can turn dangerous very quickly in spiritual ways. The second way that I want to talk about this morning is how, uh, and how our culture bombards us is what I refer to as the I want it now mentality. I want you to take a look at this picture. Does anybody know who that is? That's, uh, that's Veruca Salt, by the way, from Willy Wonka. And when this movie first came out, can I tell you, I think most people were like, oh, I can't believe her attitude, you know? Can I tell you we're a world full of Veruca Salts right now? <laughs> that I want it now. I want it now, and, 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 and if I don't get it, I'm going to whine about it. Look, the reality is that I am in that camp, unfortunately. See, we no longer have patience in this culture. For the very few of you in this place that have patience, good job. Good job. I, I've shared up here before that I struggle, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm on the interstate and I've got a truck driver in one lane and a truck driver in the other lane and they're going the same speed for 15 minutes, can somebody please slow down or speed up? Or how about being in the checkout lane, following somebody that's paying with a check? It's 2023, we can use a debit card, okay? Look... <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I'm in this with you. It, it's un unfortunate we live in a culture that values impatience over patience. Look, it's devastating when these two cultural snags often combine with one another. They make the Great Commission into something that feels impossible to live up to. Impossible. You see, our culture would have us believe that in order to follow the Great Commission, we need to get as many people to listen to us as quickly as possible. And if we don't, well, then we're not doing what we're supposed to for the kingdom of God. Right? This is what our culture would make us believe. And, and not only that, but if we take it a step further, because we live in the I want it now culture, we are expecting to see the fruit of whatever we're doing immediately. Immediately. So if we love on somebody and we don't see anything from that immediately, well, then that must mean that we're not having an impact for Jesus. Right? See how dangerous the culture can be when we follow it over the Word of God? If we don't see the, see the fruit immediately, if we don't see what God is doing, we almost give up, don't we? Almost like, well, I tried. This is too hard for me. I can't do this because what's being asked of me, obviously, I'm not good at. But what if us believers are making the Great Commission into something way more complicated than it truly is supposed to be? What if the Great Commission, in fact, what if Jesus called us to, to do something way more simple? And that was to love the person that is right in front of us. What if that's what we're supposed to do? What if we're not supposed to look at the crowd? What if we're supposed to look at the person that's right in front of us and love on them? Right. See, this feeling that we need to reach to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, and to see the fruit immediately does not match how Jesus did ministry. See, his ministry model was way more different than that. It's way different. It is true that at times Jesus had thousands of people showing up at his doorstep. At times he had a following, he had people that were pressed up against him. But can I tell you, in a lot of those cases, what we hear is the crowd just didn't get it. They didn't understand what he was speaking to them. They didn't understand what he was doing. But we often 
We, in fact, more than that, see that in the Gospels, Jesus is intentionally connecting with the individual. He's intentionally taking what the Father has given him and pouring it out to an individual. My mind goes to certain encounters in the Bible where Jesus could have chosen to speak to the crowd, but he chose to love on the individual instead, the individual that was right in front of him. Last week, Jessica was up here, and she talked to us about Zacchaeus. Here's a guy that was in the middle of a crowd. He had to climb up on a tree to get over the crowd. Jesus could have stopped right there and had a sermon on the mount right in front of that crowd, but instead, what did he do? He pointed to the individual. He said, Zacchaeus, come down from there. How about about the fact that, how about when Jesus went to the the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5? Here, Here Jesus is. He's in front of who knows how many, maybe hundreds of people that are crippled and struggling that need healing. And he could have snapped his fingers and said, everybody listen to me. But instead, what did he do? He went right straight to the individual and said, do you want to be healed? And he told him to rise, and he was healed. Imagine what that testimony did to the rest of the people sitting there. We don't talk about that a lot. I can't imagine if you were sitting there in that place that you weren't moved to have a little faith in the guy that just healed a man that was crippled for 28 years, right? You, you, you would have that too. How about the, the woman at the well? The woman at the well See, Jesus could have bypassed her altogether and went to the town. But instead, he chose to love on a woman that everybody else would have thrown away. And because of that, the woman brought the town to him. Do you see how this works? Jesus, the way he did ministry, is different. The model is different. He he does things differently. There are many more of these encounters in Scripture where we see Jesus choose to meet an individual over meeting the crowd. See, in John 13, 35, it says, Jesus tells us that people will know we are his by the way we love the crowd. Was that wrong? What does it say? By the way we love one another. By the way we love one another. That's how people, that's how the world, that's how our culture will know that we are his by the way we love one another. That's so important because he does not say that people will know we are his by how the number of people that like our Christian Facebook post. He does not say that people will know we are his by how many people we can get to listen to us at church. He does not say that we will know we are his, they will know we are his by how fast we can convert a non-believer. Like it's some kind of game or something. Jesus says they will know we are his by the way we love one another. Jesus was intentional in everything he did and in every interaction that he had. One person at a time was the biggest part of what he did and still does to this day. Can I tell you, if you're sitting here as a believer, at some point, Jesus left the 99 for you. I don't care if you were seven years old or 77 when you came to Christ. At one point, you were lost, and he left the 99 to find you, the individual, the one. You see, folks, because of our culture, though, we try to make it a numbers game. But it's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite. It's not a numbers game at all. You see, we often do not realize the impact we can have on the world by loving on one individual at a time. A great lady by the name of Mother Teresa once said, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. That's an amazing quote. You know why? Because it's true, I alone, I without God cannot change the world, but I can love on one person and let that make ripples. I want you to take a look at a picture. I wonder if any of you, any of you know who this is. It's a guy by the name of Edward Kimball. Underneath it says church helper. 
And, and I'm going I'm to tell you right now about Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball, I will lay claim that most of you are in this place today because of this man. And you don't even know who he is. I'm gonna, I'm, let, me, let me tell you the progression of Edward Kimball, and I think it's going to surprise you a little bit. In 1854, Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher in Detroit. And one day he went to visit a 17-year-old boy who was in a Sunday school class that literally just didn't like God. He just didn't want anything to do with God. And by the time he got done with him, this interaction with him, he had led him to Christ. Isn't that amazing? Well, that young man that he led to Christ was D.L. Moody, who went on to become one of the greatest evangelists of all time in the world, sharing the gospel with 100 million people. He founded Moody Bible Institute right here in Chicago. So you, you likely have at least heard of him here and there. And if the story stopped right there, that would be pretty amazing, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't stop like right there at all. See, through his ministry, Moody was responsible for a London pastor named F.B. Meyer coming to faith. Meyer was re responsible for J. Wilbur Chapman coming to faith. And Chapman influenced Billy Sunday, another prominent evangelist of the 20th century. Billy Sunday was integral in a man named Mordecai Ham, which is the coolest name I've heard all day, coming to faith. And Mordecai Ham was the preacher responsible for leading a young man named Billy Graham to Christ. Do you see what loving on one individual can do? Do you see the impact that having a little bit of time and focusing on one person can do to the world? Edward Kimball met Dwight Moody right where he was and loved him right where he was. And because of that, many of you are sitting here today as believers. Many of you can root your belief into one of those men, if not, if not the one, the final one there. He did not do anything seemingly extravagant, though, right? He just shared his faith with a boy that just wasn't sure he liked God at all. But he did do what Jesus did. And we know that Jesus, in everything he did, was extravagant for the kingdom of God. Amen? When you focus on the individual right in front of you, you're literally speaking into somebody's eternity. It's interesting, when you speak into somebody's eternity, and then they speak into somebody's eternity, and then they speak into somebody's eternity, do you understand that you're not just speaking to one person? You understand that whatever you do today, whatever interaction you have, whoever you love on today, isn't just about one person? Can we grasp onto that? Eternally speaking, it's way more. Edward Kimball wasn't preaching to the masses, yet he ended up affecting billions of lives by loving on one kid in an intersection of his life. See, Jesus knew that there are certain moments in life that people come to where they have an opportunity to go a different path or to stay on the same path. These are truly what I call life intersections. Now, I think most of us know what an intersection is in the natural, right? If you guys want to show the picture. I, I can tell you sometimes we come across an easy intersection, right? There's no traffic in sight. You can almost blow past, which I don't, don't, don't do that. You can always blow past. But this, there's no blowing past this, right? You have to figure out, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. I, I could go straight, I could turn, I, I, where, which way do I go? And you know what, what do we find at intersections? Don't we find signs? Don't, as we approach an intersection, or we get into an inter intersection, we find a sign that's telling us when to stop, when to go, maybe even a sign that points to a different destination, and even some signs that warn us of danger up ahead. I wonder, would you be willing to be a sign in someone's life intersection? Would you be willing to stand as, as, as a sign in somebody's life? Maybe somebody's moment where they, they, they don't know what to do. They don't know which direction to go. They don't even know if they should stay on the same path. Well, folks, that's what focusing on one person at a time is truly doing. 
When you love the one right in front of you, you may get the privilege, privilege to tell someone that there is a better way. You may get the chance to warn them that there is danger up ahead. And you may even get the chance to be the one that lets them know that they are seen by God. What a privilege. Look, I can't think of a better example of this in Scripture than in Luke 8. We come across a story, if you guys want to turn to Luke 8, starting in verse 42. We come across a story where Jesus is trying to go and walk towards healing Jairus' daughter, and the crowd starts to press in against him. Here we go with the crowd once again. And we pick up in verse 42b. It says, As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. It's interesting, Jesus stopped in, stopped in his tracks. Again, once, once again, he could have spoke to the crowd, the pressing in against him. But he stopped in his tracks for this individual. Why? I think it's because he realized that this woman was at a crucial intersection of her life. And that intersection might not be what you think it is. You see, we often in church, we focus on the fact that Jesus healed of, her, of the blood disorder, right? But if, what if that isn't why Jesus stopped? It says in there that this woman was healed immediately. That means that she could have left. She could have just hightailed it out of there and said, I got my healing, I'm done, I'm out. Jesus could have kept going and went toward Jairus' daughter, but he didn't. They both stopped. Why? I think it's because Jesus recognized she needed something greater than physical healing. You see, when Jesus chose to stop and address her as daughter, what he was saying to her is, I see you. I see you. You are not disposable. You are not garbage. I have never forgotten about you. I have never forsaken you. I have never come to a point where I didn't see the pain that you're in and poured my heart out towards you. I see you, daughter. That is what Jesus was doing, and that's more than physical healing. That's spiritual healing. That woman needed to know that her God sees her. And can I tell you, I think that some of you do too. Some of you need to know that you may be in the pain, the worst part of your life, but God sees you. God sees what you're going through. God cares about her, cares about you, cares about me. And he spoke, Jesus spoke to the intersection she was in and showed her that she was not disposable. Jesus did this kind of thing all through the Gospels. He recognized when people were at these moments in their life and spoke uniquely into their circumstances. Folks, as believers, we have been called to do the same. The Great Commission wasn't just some awesome thing that he said. It was something that he's saying, look, I've saved you. I've shown you the light. I've shown you what you need to do. Now go do it. Go do, go do as I've done for you. Show people that they are loved and valued and that they are children of God. Amen. The big part of that is understanding and learning what intersection a person is in. And that can only be done by asking Holy Spirit for guidance. Right? We can't do that alone. We can't do that alone. But this is what I want to say to you. 1 Peter 3.15 says to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. 
We are called to be prepared at all times to share the hope that we have living inside of us. But this is what I want to tell you. Sometimes people are not in that particular intersection yet. Sometimes, in fact, many times, people need for us just to show them that we want to know them. That we care, that they're important, not because of some agenda, but because they have been created in the image of God and are worth it. Which means that even if their views, their theology, and their lifestyle does not match up with ours, we can still get to know them and show them they are worth our time and love. We can let them know that they are seen and that we care about their story, that we value them as a person. And you never know. If you can do that, if you can walk alongside somebody in that manner, you never know one day they might trust you enough to ask you about your hope, about the hope that lives inside of you. And then you'll be prepared, right? You'll be prepared to share the hope that you have living inside of you because we've been called to do that at all times, to be prepared at all times. Folks, we have to be open to the idea that these intersections are going to look different for each person. But if we would be would let the Holy Spirit guide us. He will show us how He wants us to do that, how He wants to uniquely love on the person right in front of us. Now, I want to take a quick left turn and I'm going to finish off the sermon today like this. I talked earlier about influencers, right? And how we want to leave a legacy. But can I tell you, that's not truly what we're supposed to do. It, it's not about, sorry, it's not about the fact that we leave a legacy for ourselves. It's about we leave a legacy that's already being left through Jesus. It shouldn't be about us. It should be about loving on the person in front of us to show them the Jesus that we know. Edward Kimball wasn't concerned with leaving a legacy for himself. He was concerned for, for getting the legacy out there about Jesus. And so on that note today, I wanted to bring to you a song the worship team's going to sing for you. It's called Only Jesus. And I truly hope that the words of this song bless you the way they've blessed me. And that you keep in mind that, the, that, that what we're supposed to do as believers is spread his word, his name, not ours. Jesus. 
Jesus and I your mother's day and also the one thing you leave with today i pray it's this that you will live every second pointing to the jesus to our savior to the one who went to the cross for us died the death that we should have died lived the life that that we should have lived and did it for you god bless have a great rest of your day hope to see you next week